that you can get this set of speed arguments. You may have to be. Hello. Well, hi, everyone. I'm really honored to, I'm Alex Verslowski, really honored to introduce our four poets today. I'm especially honored to introduce uh, Darius Adapeka, uh, who uh, is an incredible poet and is um, reading from his mother's volume of poetry today. Darius is the author of the chat book, How Many Love Poems, and the editor of his mother, Susan Adafat Peckham's posthumous collection, this one, Deep Are These Distances Between Us. And his work has appeared in poetry magazine, Poem a Day, Shenandoah, among other journals. He studies English and Near Eastern languages and civilizations at Harvard. And if it's okay with me saying this, he'll be go going to, uh, he's going to start an MFA program at Missioner in Austin, Texas this fall, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Um, this is a really beautiful volume, including an essay of Darius's reflecting on his mother um, and uh, the story behind finding these poems. And it'll bring me to tears, probably. There are some beautiful poems that she wrote um, when she was pregnant with her son, and then when he was born, seven months, 10 months, there's a, a lot of really interesting poetry about her grandfather, father, which really resonates with Darius, his own poetic, which involves um, poems to his BB, his grandmother. So I just felt very honored to be graced with this book. And thank you, Darius, for putting it together. Um, and then next we'll have Athena Nasser, uh, an Egyptian American poet. She's an essayist and a short story writer from Atlanta, Georgia. She's the author of the debut poetry collection, Little Houses, um, published by Sundress Publications. She is a finalist for the 2021 Poets Out Loud Prize and the 2021 Academy of American Poets College Prize, and has been published in. Her work has been published in Academy of American Poets, the Missouri Review, Southern Humanities Review, among other journals. So we're very excited for Athena's poetry tonight. And next we will have Robert Woodlin read. Um, Robert Woodlin is a poetry, poet from Virginia. His collection, Mothman Apologia, was the winner of the 2021 Yale Younger Poets Prize and the 2023 Kate Tufts Discovery Award. His chapbook, How to Maintain Eye Contact, was released by Button Poetry in January of this year. And his poems have been featured or forthcoming in American Poetry Review, Plowshares, and Poetry Magazine, among other journals. So we're very excited to hear Robert's poems tonight. And our final reader will be J.D. Debris. Um, the author, he's the author of the Scorpions question mark, winner of the 2022 Donald Justice Prize. He received his MFA from NYU, where he was a Goldwater Fellow, and his work has received further awards from Plowshares and Narrative. So please let us welcome these poets. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. Full oh, house, very sweet. I know a lot of you, um, and it really, it's really touching um, that you're all here uh, to support me mostly, uh, <laughs> or not mo me mostly, but like <laughs> the fact that you are here to support me is what I'm grateful for <laughs> mostly, <laughs> because uh, this is a really uh, this is a really emotionally uh, hefty project. Um, and I just feel so much gratitude to all of my friends who are here um, and family. And, uh, um, but yeah, so this is my, my mother's second collection of poetry. Uh, she had a book of poems come out in 2001. Uh, this was 
three years before she died in a car accident um, that I was also in. Um, and that book sort of acted for me uh, as my entire, you know, relationship with her. Uh, I, I was I was reading those poems constantly growing up, um, you know, it almost to the point where poetry and poets and poems became um, synonymous with my mother, even if they weren't written by her. Um, and once I realized that there were more of them, I uh, was like, oh, maybe I should keep these to myself selfishly. <laughs> and then and then I was like, no, I shouldn't. I can't gatekeep um, my mom's beautiful poems. Um, and I decided that I might I was um, going to send them out and Kevin Carey Press did a beautiful job bringing it out. Um, but yeah, I, I think that one thing that I, I'm still learning how to do is um, how to differentiate my poetics from her poetics, uh, how to allow my voice to be a part of, um, of her voice and and feel okay with that <laughs> uh, as I read them out loud. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna experiment a little bit later on in the year and do some stuff. Like I wanna um, do readings with many different voices that uh, different people who um, are of the Iranian diaspora or knew her, uh, loved her, that would come up and read potentially. I think it might be difficult, but I, I would think it would be really beautiful. But right now, I think I did this yesterday for the book launch online. And I liked it. And I think um, in the forward, I include some of her language um, in interviews. So I think I'm going to start with that. Um, so in this interview with poets and writers, she said, going back, there were many spaces, the cultural distances, the linguistic distances. When I write the poems, I'm trying to bring us together in some space that is sacred to me. We all exist in our ancestors and our spirits are very much from our ancestors. I'm interested in discovering what that is, which parts of us are from the past. Um, and I think that one thing that's really fascinating about what she said there was also both, you know, in my poetics, I'm thinking about uh, what parts of us come from the past, but also kind of what um, remain in the future and what, like how our ancestors speak from us. Um, and, and this idea of continuance, which is in the book, the third section is called Continuance. Um, so the first poem I wanna read is called How to Get to the House on Takti Street. Um, and it's about the house where she grew up visiting in Iran. Walk uphill on Pahlavi Avenue, turn left on the alley that aches with stray cats and follow the stucco walls two blocks. Make certain you've turned before you reach the city bus stop, once shut down for mass revolutionary executions, not the backfire of gasoline ignition, but the squeezed trigger clipping the streets, past the bazaar vendors, burning ears of corn, past the ribbed dogs that rock their barreled bodies, lifting and dropping into the gutters, past the hungry desperation of limbless beggars where your hands will pull at the seams of your empty pockets where you'll hear nina screaming even before you see her standing outside the gate grandmother inside nina's arms washed for morning prayers still dripping silver her hands cupped like a bowl filled with sunlight and water and pleading to get to this house on taxi street Think of what it means to lose your father. Think of what it means to be left behind. Think of the scream so loud it comes out in silent bowls, shimmering with the hands of those who survive. Um, the next poem I wanna read, and that, and that poem, um, I think that a lot of what Susie's work is doing is, uh, preserving uh, family members, history, um, really trying to gather around her, all of her beloveds um, and write them, you know, and represent them carefully. Uh, and that that poem featured my Khalil Nina and my grandmother who whose relationship gets teased out throughout the book. Um, this next poem is called Appearances um, and similar themes going with the ancestral and the spiritual. Um, appearances. When Emmett Esmat's heart gives way, 80 years old, 
seizing, then trembling, tight rhythm, still. Mother says, don't tell your father. How many deaths have I known of first? Blood pools in her heart, pools her ribs, veins, flesh stopped. The last time I saw her, she sat, too old to come to the airport, too old to even turn and look once I left the room. She, cross-legged on her bed by the window, white cloth poured lightly over her head and back like milk glass, like one glowing giant heart still on the sheet, the slow rise and fall of her back beneath, counting. Don't tell him, mother says. You know how he cries for his sisters. His heart will burst, she says. He will cry by himself in the folds of his hands. I've seen it before when Amu Atifat died. His hands like the cotton cover I imagined over his loins, a wisp of a man. Skin tanned, he asks in the garden corner of me and my sons, although they say he can't recall much. And I'm not sure whether father has told me this or if I imagine it, does it make a difference? When he asks, I tell my son, you come from this earth and you will go back to it. We inherit each other, speak ourselves through the skip beats of words, the dead live there and the dying suspended. In Isfahan, children pass with trays of fruit, candy and tea at the grave in exchange for blessings and prayers. I am not there to see the sun burn dry silver webs of dew, squeeze blades of grass, the stones, the slow disappearances of those beneath. Nina calls. And Esmet hears, but cannot speak. The garden hose cut and wrapped around her neck working the flesh with markings that leave red welts for weeks. She chokes a sound, struggles, the edges of the hose hanging sharp behind her back where he stands and tightens again, squeezing her throat. And I think, was this how it felt for grandfather in the end? Nina, irate, stops waiting comes out to complain from her bedroom, sees grandmother's legs kick the corner window. And when Nina sees her stockings, the man behind grandmother, garden hose in one hand, carpet blade in the other, crazed eyes, she screams and screams and screams the kind of scream that outdoes any house alarm, the scream that begins in the dark deep of the uterus and climbs the body for air from the black throat of the earth to the rocks, to the roses, to the street, through the city, to the mosque, to the sky, and into heaven, where she imagines grandfather, even, will hear the intruder jumping the wall and scampering past the wild dogs, a neighbor in pursuit who never catches him, the rest of the neighbors bursting from their doors, climbing the gate, the walls, pouring out like molten steel while Nina screams and grandmother lies in the asphalt, alive, her legs limp, her stockings marked with mud, the water still running, rolling dirt bubbling around the roses. And they all look at Nina, the way her round thighs press together, pinching her dress in between a tiny mountain, Bashville, often called unwell, crazy, a terrible pain, who is now quiet. They think what they never thought before, Thank God for Nina, mother says. Thank God there is always an ear listening in the silence. Um, yeah, the poetics in this book are really interesting because they're much different from her first book. If you go back and read that kind of sleep, uh, her debut, it was very like measured pacing, um, very careful, accessible, trying sort of to relate or translate an experience. Um, to a reader who hasn't been to Iran, who hasn't um, who hasn't gotten to see it firsthand. And this book, I think of it more like, um, she was really interested in Sufi poetics and Sufism. And I think of it as this sort of, like there are these long lists and of images and um, this like really lovely, like flowing cadence um, that's linked by commas uh, mostly. And what I think of it as is this like linguistic, like 
Sufi dance um, that she's doing in her palms. Um, and she gets to, I don't know, it gives her so much range. Um, but the, the next poem I want to read is more in keeping with that first book, I think. Uh, and they're the poems to me, which are, I found when I was young and I, they were the first poems that I found from the book. Um, and they really floored me, obviously, for obvious reasons, but um, it was also, uh, yeah, it was just partly because I'd never read at, up to that point anything that was addressed to me from her. Um, and I couldn't, I have no memories of her. She died when I was three. Um, so this poem is called uh, Two to My Son at Seven Months. For now, you fill my palms, my arms, with warm and quiet song, and I am glad. When the earth should fold my breathing to its breast and hold me there, I would swallow stones, would tear its roots, its trees for missing you, your face, your open hands spread soft and round, ice flowers on my throat. And I should always smell your breath bloom down my folding arms, sweet, white, milkweed, aging, flying from this frozen ground. Um, and I think that one of, the, one of the things about that poem was that I feel like for a while after I read it, I couldn't look at my hands without thinking of ice flowers. Um, I couldn't, there are ways in which when I read a poem by my mother, uh, it completely changes the lens through which I look at the world. Um, and I think that's one of the, the greatest effects um, of having a mother who is a poet. <laughs> um, and then I'm gonna make sure that we have time, but I would like to do uh, maybe one more. Um, this is called Lower Manhattan. Uh, if you're lost, look for the World Trade Center and you'll find your way home. A passersby. My mother grew up in New York. From the United Nations International School on FDR Drive and 25th Street, mother and I walked the wind north 15 blocks to meet father who waited for us at the United Nations, the Hudson River lapping its edges, lifting our hair to the brass of rush hour traffic and the twin towers gleamed with western sunlight if I looked over my small shoulder. If you are lost, look for this shining, shadows looming over the bay as the Staten Island Ferry pushed its way from lower Manhattan through Hudson Water home to New Jersey, the skyline receding till the towers slipped between the closing pinch of my thumb and forefinger, my eye just behind. This city, in the palms of my hands, beneath spaces of clamped fingers, where I carried it to France, Iran, Switzerland, Texas, Nebraska, Michigan, where I still hold it, the years I've left behind. How will I find my way home? My palms burn. If you are lost, look for my eyes, hot in your hands. Carry me there, bright, burning, and alive. Thank you. Okay. Hello. First, I just wanted to say, Darius, that was absolutely beautiful. Um, and second, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. Um, I have my my mentor, uh, Daniel Tobin, who came, and my friends, and my mom. So thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to be reading a few poems from my uh, debut collection, Little Houses, that came out in January. And um, 
First, I'm going to start off with the prologue poem, Alligator. To your lover, you say, swallow me whole. To the world, you say, come dip your ladles in my fertile belly. The well is always full. The water is always warm where the sun beats down. I say you should cry where nobody will hear you. On the bank where I am pulling you out of its mouth, I am clutching you by your legs, each leg kicking back as if part of you wants to stay wedged in the throat of what will kill you. On the surface where it hovers, I find you, a mouth impregnated with pomegranate, juice streaming down your chin like a punctured artery. The earth waits to open and drag you under. Pray for him, then leave him buried in the house with the holes in the walls in the belly of his own outrage. Close your mouth. The world will never lift a glass to your dry, wrinkled lips. No one will ever love you like you do. I pray you will emerge from its throat, wet and awake and gasping for air. It is not your lover. It is not your enemy. It is you, stranded in a body of fresh water, feeding on your own hunger to please. Okay, so my next poem is um, Little Houses, my title poem. We walk in and out of little houses, and I pretend the bonds between state and people do not concern me. I have no friends in the whole state of Georgia, and if I could, I would disown the state itself. Surely if it hadn't disowned me first. In the Art History Museum, I point at pretty paintings that I cannot touch or blend into, but only admire, Masha'Allah. God bless it. Is it God who has willed me to be so detached from men or my own state of unwillingness? If I were to sculpt a state of my own, it would be called the province of vagina, assuming it hasn't already been colonized by some Anglo-Saxon European monarchy. As mixed girls, we are forever stuck in between little houses, little bathrooms with little mirrors and a man waiting for his turn. But wouldn't it be indulgent to stay a while? To sit in the middle of two brush strokes without being claimed by the province of purple? Van Gogh fed on yellow paint in fits of anxiety. However, I lock myself inside infinity rooms. In light of God's will, I split into microscopic versions of an abstract Egypt to go down easier. There were no portraits of Arab girls in the post-impressionist era, but if there were, her eyes would weep honey so rich that it would dare the painter himself to crave yellow. She would be hung on the walls of some aristocrat's estate down south, and she would hate it there. To manifest is to walk in and out of little houses and pretend you built them, to pray for a kaleidoscope of gods, and hope that one of them is you. Can you see us now, 2017 Super Bowl? I am a house fly floating in a cold glass of milk. I'm at a friend's house watching the game. Her grandfather points at the players swarming around the ball, says Negroes shouldn't get tattoos, can't see them anyway his southern drawl savoring the E in Negroes, his recliner a throne made of cotton. I don't tell him about the ancient Egyptians stenciling blue symbols into their flesh before the punk rock bands made it popular, the painted people in Abydos carving gods onto their stomachs to protect their unborn children. We were branding ourselves long before the boats came. We were branding ourselves millenniums before the cop brought the weight of his knee, a hot iron to brand a black neck. It is half time and I am thinking about what my folks are doing. What I want to say is at my house, we watch basketball. We eat whole racks of lamb and wash them down with whole milk. We eat, we take up space, we support black and shit. Instead I say, good game. My Judgment Day. 
Don't you have any morals left to flock around your naked body in the grass like turkey vultures? Their cluster of heads, kidney bean red, their eyes little tomatoes. Don't you have any morals left to eat you and eat you, to hang you up on the cross and feast their eyes on your flushed face, on your head hung low? Don't you have any grief left to beat you while you cry out to the heavenly father, his palms pink from beating you? Don't you have any mothers left to bathe you in an ocean of cleanliness, in a hot spring of sweat, cooling, and a pressure cooker of gods? Don't you forgive yourself for the nights with the men draped around your back like sheepskin, the men hung like curtains that open, you, open for you? Don't you enjoy yourself as you live in one night and another, as you inhale the day and hold it in your lungs, two swollen dates on the verge of bursting out of your chest. If the day is a vineyard, you are the crusher of grapes, your bare feet bleeding wine, your mouth bleeding a full and round laugh, leaking into the night air, thicker than kissing thighs, much darker than heaven, much sweeter than the fruit jammed between your toes. Don't you have any shame, a stampede of hooves to crush you? They crush you. Okay, this is my second to last one. It's called um, The Performance. Someone wishes me a blessed solar return. And later that night, I blow out my candles. Little wisps of smoke dancing around the puffed up souffle. Sometimes I wish to be the man in the strip club with his hands behind his head, or rather the woman popping her perfectly round ass against his lap, a big ass planet orbiting to the beat of Megan Thee Stallion singing body adi 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 adi. <laughs> I wonder what it would feel like to undress myself to that kind of praise, to squat naked in the center of someone's universe and say, don't touch. On the streets of Paris, the woman they called the hot and top Venus was purchased by a man who showcased her beside a rhinoceros. Those who passed would gawk at her full body draped in ostrich feathers, stick their hands through the cage to squeeze the fat on her hips. They pulled at her brown flesh as if she had the thick hide of the rhinoceros itself. She did not get to undress herself. This was done by the men who paid to strip her of her feathers. I do not wear feathers. When I give myself to someone, I am the one who gives myself back. When I blow out my candles, everyone sitting wide eyed around the table, there's a part of me that wishes to light them and blow them out, just to light them again. After the applause, I drag the knife through the souffle and pull it out, custard dripping from the blade. Georgia bleeds. Georgia bleeds red mud, quick and narrow like a stream, an artery that cannot be corked. Trucks wear Confederate flags like a slip dress in the summertime. And I laugh because it makes me think of my grandmother's hijab pulled tight around her skinny face. The flags spitting out little drops of blood breeze by the paved streets of I-85. So Georgia is bleeding, but nobody cares enough to run cold water on its incisions, or at least pray for a quick and painless death. Heat runs through my blood, dry like Egypt's narrow streets or the irritably hot winter. Suburbia is a blue flame I cannot stomp out with the bottom of my shoe. It is not an anthill, it is not a monarchy. There is no queen of insert boring street name. They do not bear the wounded on their backs like saints if it isn't Sunday. They attend church services, their skin sun dipped in spray tans. In sun hats, they look sugar from the rim of lemon drop martinis. Heaven is a members only country club with grilled chicken kebabs and mint yogurt and rose beel sharia and no entrance for Arab girls. Okay, yeah, I think I have time for one more, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm gonna read, um, Athena as Princess Peach.
Okay. Athena as Princess Peach. I find myself wedged between Mario and Bowser, afraid my pretty pink gown will snag on his shell decorated with teeth from girls like me, girls that don't have toads to wish upon. I am a girl whose crown has been mauled by a kitchen blender, vision blurred by pixels. He presses Y and I dive into a prana plant. I don't ask why through my pink lipstick, lips sealed shut. Is it wrong to be a girl who screams, finish him? I wasn't programmed to jump from the back balcony into the moat. My manual doesn't give me instructions to escape through pipes, flying turtles, jewelry meant to weigh me down into the blades. I can't freeze the vines that wrap around my pearls so tight. Super Mario feeds me grapes to keep me entertained. Bowser dips my hair in lava to see how far I'll go. Thank you. Psalm for the hater, sorry, Psalm for the haters in the back. As a child, I read once about a criminal on the run so long she forgot her own name, forgot even that she was on the run at all. No one more surprised by her capture in the end than herself. It was the sort of thing I didn't believe was possible, but also the sort of thing I figured would probably happen to me. Maybe it already has. Here I am, not counting down the days until the cops show up and kick these doors down in the name of someone else's law. When that time comes, when the front door swings off its hinges, I hope I know what to do, like so many sea turtle hatchlings, squirming towards an ocean, a lost dog breaking into a run when it hears its name for the first time in years. Um, I'm very excited to be here um, to read with this incredible group of poets, Darius, Athena, and JD. Um, and James, thank you for bringing us all together. And to Crowlier, this is one of my favorite bookstores in the world. Um, I'm reading, the first few poems I'm going to read are from my book, Mothman Apologia, um, which is out last year on Yale University Press. And this is voicemail from my mother. You know, I haven't heard from you in a while. Did I tell you a bird flew into the house, found an open door on a cold day? Something small, like a chickadee, but even more chickadee than that. I chased it around the house with an upturned broom until I lost track through all that sweeping of dirty air. This was a ways back, two cats ago. I didn't see it fly out, so it's hung in my mind ever since an unclosed parenthesis. I braced myself, the way the ear hears a squeal of brakes and begs for a thud. Brace myself to find a tiny skeleton each time I clean behind the curtains or rearrange the furniture. Today, opening the drawer of cords that go to things I probably already threw away, it flew out, perched briefly on my shoulder, then alighted hard and I mean hard, into the mirror of the closed window. And this is the summer after the winter I taught you how to start a fire. You asked me what I knew about thermals, heat's tendency to rise, cool, fall again, and so I showed you how to recognize a circle of turkey vultures over our neighbor's field as a clue, another calf had died. Immediately, you declared yourself the detective of all dead things. Something's dead, you'd say, squinting skyward. Case closed, that'll be $50. It was one of your better jokes, and as with all jokes, funny at first, then a little less, until repeated only as an epitaph for how funny it once was. 50 American dollars. 
this debt smoldering like your anger after I told you the words, I love you, work the same way. I was careful to say so in the joking tone reserved for the parts of this living too disappointing to speak plain. Something's dead, you'd say, a skill precisely too late to be of any use. Same as me here, explaining the joke, the check I'd mail if I had your new address. Um, and I'm just gonna read uh, four more poems from my chapbook, How to Maintain Eye Contact, which is out this spring from um, Button Poetry. Opportunity. There would be more mornings, more dark pink of sun through closed eyelids, more people rolling over to check that the other was still there. The day they left the rover alone on Mars, most didn't read the news, and most of those who did didn't read about the rover, a wandering machine supposed to last for only 90 days. But 90 days passed and still there were more mornings. People continued to wake up startled, to churn their way through the covers to find someone. Some never did, in beds too big or apartments too small. There were more mornings for the rover too, thousands more, until everyone who wasn't a computer lost count, until the rover made mornings the wrong metric altogether. Back then, those thousand days ago, you'd wake up grasping for me in a panic that felt new each time. Morning always the same dark pink that Mars looks in that selfie the rover took just before it stopped responding. I'm sorry, I love you. Always the first things you'd say aloud until I stopped hearing the comma. Not something you needed me to know so much as a ping sent to a wandering machine, worlds away, still listening for who knows how long. At the end of before. We were halal carts in the bike lanes and we were bikes on the sidewalk. We were cats sleeping under parked cars and parks sipping from the shower beer of the East River. We were joy, or at least no one marked joy absent during roll call. We were strangers on the train making friends and we were the mercy of friends on the train pretending not to see each other. We were the long sadness of having, and we were having had it just about up to here. We were people sleeping and sleeping people waking to text that asked, you up? We were sex and the hot embarrassment of being, but also being together one last time without knowing it was the last time. We were making plans we had no intention of keeping, and we were all this tiresome keeping of time and house and secrets and calm. Forgive us. Someone gave us all this to give away, and still we tried to keep it for ourselves. We were all this and my father's way of answering the phone. Is everything all right? We were everything. All right. So I'm just going to read two more. Um, this is This Side of Parnonis. I came all the way down to the bottom of this mountain, Capella, to find only the beginning of another mountain. As if this descent was a mistake in need of steep remediation. At the bottom of the mountain, I find you, a donkey named after a star. Capella, long ago on the subway in a city you've never been to, I watched a handsome stranger reading some thick novel called The Body Language of Horses. He was so graceful sitting there, I went online to buy myself a copy. I found it wasn't a novel, but an actual guide to the body language of horses. Listen to me, Capella. No one should be named after anything destined to burn out and explode. Besides, your ears are far too relaxed to meet that fate. You're no horse, Capella, but I know a little how to read you. Follow me back up this hill, and I will feed you all the apples I can steal from breakfast. I will write a book about the language of donkeys. 
Capella, imagine how beautiful the strangers reading us will be. In New York, I invent new kinds of lonely, but here, at least, there is only the one. All right. So um, I am going to read my last poem, but uh, before I do that, uh, I just want to say I'm really excited to read with my friend J.D. Debris, his book, Scorpion's Question Mark, is a really special book. It's right now, it's out um, uh, like last week. When's the when's the official launch? It's like right, yeah, it's right away. Um, so I will uh, hurry off the stage so that we can hear J.D. read, but I'm very excited to be here reading with him. This is at the coffee shop on Rogers. When I was done, I took my teacup to the busing station where the tub said no trash. So I fished out the tea bag, but the only trash can had one of those blue liners. So I couldn't tell if it was for recycling. I decided to throw the tea bag out in the garbage on the street, which meant carrying it there, dripping in my hand like a dead bird. One I didn't kill, but still felt moved to bury. The barista saw and asked me why as if a reason was another license I'd forgotten to renew. Composting. I said I was desperate for compost for my garden. Now every morning she gives me handfuls of spent tea bags, the way the cat would bring me offerings of dead birds, which seemed sweet until I read how cats think we can't take care of ourselves. After being fitted for a hearing aid, my deaf friend was most surprised to find sunlight didn't hum was unsettled by how cats could choose to move in silence. She became obsessed with the sounds of birds, collective at first, then individual, quiet only in repose. Like these tea bags I throw away on the street and feel guilty I don't have a garden, not even a balcony. The cat's been dead for years. It's morning and my hands are soggy, I know, for the stupidest reason. In spite of the evidence, I'm getting good at being alone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hey, one more time for Darius, Athena, and Robert. How about that? We're coming here at one time for James, doing incredible things with the Goldian. Hey, so tell me something before we begin. Who's gonna watch the Celtics game after this? You have to? Not anymore, you're not. Cause I'm gonna read until 10.45. No, I'm just playing. We're going to your house after the watch, right? A piracy, the early spring. A long exhale at the end of a hyperventilating season. All winter, nothing touched my neck except the clenched manic teeth of the electric razor, the beach winds, salt. Marvin Hagler, my home state's fiercest fighter, a man so mean, they say hair feared his sweat gleamed skull is gone. I've mimicked his ritual, mornings, breathless, sprinting the hill. A sea and continent apart, your curls are on my mind. By the logic, and legend of that bald fallen boxer, your curls mean mercy, are wild and fertile as these blossoms blindsiding New England spring. Vines around a cello's neck, its body split, a beehive inside. I dreamt we kissed so slow, it was like breathing for the first time. I was like, was that for 10 minutes or what? No, just make it so we good. I gotta slow myself down. I don't have this much material. I'm trying to keep you here all night. <laughs> so anyway, I'm very sore from, you know, just, just bench pressing the bar the other day. I'm an ex-boxer. And the joke among gym bros is that weightlifters can't fight and boxers can't lift weights. I can't lift weights. So this relevant information for this poem. It's also relevant if my arms just give out on me, but. <laughs> The voice of Hercules. And I know it's Heracles, but I said it Hercules. The voice of Hercules. Remembering that heavyweight we call Hercules, a mellow steroid fiend who never sparred, 
just raised barbells till he was swollen as that solemn British killer from Ninja 2, Shadow of a Tear. He'd flex, hit vacuum poses in ringside mirrors, taking photo after photo and lounge in the locker room, nothing but a sideways socks hat on. A garden variety goon with a garbled guttural monotone and shriveled steroid balls. So Hercules seemed on the surface. But every word he spoke was praise. So sick, bro, softly, near inaudible. <laughs> Is it because I did the voice? Yeah. Right, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that next time. One night, the gym screened a pay-per-view, De La Hoya or Money May. All us gym rats came back in jewelry, jeans, and the reek of cologne instead of sweat to cozy up between dormant heavy bags and watch the fights projected on industrial concrete. I brought my old acoustic for between fight amusement, background strumming a soundtrack to our cacophony. Hercules sat beside me saying, bro, can you play a corrido beat? I started to strum a stock waltz meter and Hercules in a bass bel canto that could rumble the cheap seats of an opera hall began a Spanish ballad about a lost bantamweight named Amen who disappeared, the lyrics went, to Mexico last spring, whom no one had heard from since. The gym was quiet one verse in, pay-per-view muted, everyone listening to this supposed bonehead channel beauty, to his ballad, its fragility. Fly, little dove, fly, he'd sigh at verse's end. I'm amazed nobody laughed at him. Insults back then are lingua franca and form of praise. In that moment so holy and ridiculous, when his lips formed O's on long, pure tones, and every chord perfectly, somehow, harmonized. I can't tell you which prize fighter won that bout, or if we gorged on pizza and beer, blowing off our weight-making regimens. I can't tell you if it rained. I can't pretend to know if sparks flew inside all those ears bent in unison toward the amen Hercules encanted. As for him, his trainer, a hard-ass Marine, got sick of his preening and told him go find another gym where he could kiss his biceps in the mirror and drink his creatine and beast his endless deadlift reps. How many songs has he sung since in the shower of a distant gym where he still takes his sweet time soaping every rope-like vein? What I know, I'll tell. Around the campfire of the muted fights that night, he was our horn of Gabriel, our nightingale mid-flight. Sing it again, Hercules. Aye. So, um, my first book, Scorpion's Question Mark, uh, it just came out in April from Autumn House Press. Um, I owe it all to Cornelius Eady, uh, who picked this book. I'm not going to sell my own book, but if you're trying to buy something tonight, get his brutal imagination over there. Phenomenal. Um, the This prize, the Donald Justice Prize, is for formal poetry. Um, so I'll be rhyming and using meter here and there. I'm, I'm loose with it, though. But this particular poem is in Terza Rima. Uh, Dante's rhyme scheme, y'all know that. Um, a, B, A, B, C, whatever the hell it is. I knew it when I wrote it. <laughs> but I was like, if I'm going to write in, in Dante's form, I got to write about something stupid. He already, you know, covered death and heaven and hell and all that. So uh, this poem is about getting drunk with a mermaid. And it's called Drunk with the Mermaid. <laughs> the bottom of the sea is less cruel than you'd think. She tells me, four drinks deep at the schooner, Hannah, the dive bar, not the boat, leaning in to play with the links of my secondhand crucifix. She's the great, great granddaughter of shipwrecked Cape Verdean whalers who didn't drown somehow, but instead built from wet sand, tide rack, driftwood, and clamshell houses at the sea's nadir. They fell for sub aquatic fiancés and interbred, she tells me making a life in which they were the Ishmaels, the narrators, not the interchangeable extras exed out of early Melville revisions. She sounds like distant wind chimes when she exhales, and what I thought were a few stray curls are really cursive F-shaped slits below her jawline. 
weirdly familial five drinks deep, I think of my sister who, though not half amphibian, fish or dolphin, is half Polish and can swim like a motherfucker. <laughs> Me, I just sink. She parts the dive bars, beaded curtains, leads me down cobblestone streets to the pier and swan dives in the harvest moon's reflection, extending stone smooth, polished fingers through the glints. The bottom of the sea is less cool than you think. So the backbone of this book are these two long sequences about musicians living in exile. Um, the cover is a photograph of Gato Barbieri, uh, this jazz saxophonist from Argentina. The photo was actually taken by a photographer named Lou Jones, um, who's been based in Boston for a long time. And it turns out his studio was within spitting distance of the house I lived in for years uh, near the Suffolk Downs Blue Line stop. And so he was working there and I was scribbling in my room the whole time and had no idea. And they took this graphic designer, uh, Chiquita Bab from New Mexico to bring together this connection. And we were on the same block. That's, mm -hmm. that's wild, but I think uh, the whole thing came together in a way that I can't even take credit for. Sometimes these things just fall into place. But anyway, there's, uh, this sequence called Gato Barbieri, and I'll read a few from that. The epigraph is a quote from Gato Barbieri himself. He says, the jazz people, they don't consider me a jazz musician. If I'm Latin, they don't consider me Latin. So I'm here in the middle. It's a good thing, you know why? Because they say, what do you play? I say, I play my music, Gato Barbieri. And I thought that was so cool. Uh, we kind of take a, a name, a proper name for granted sometimes, right? We hear it so much. But the fact that he took his name and used that to like define what he does, I thought was super interesting. So this is Gato Barbieri, first tango. The man in the dusk colored glasses haunts my neighborhood with his sax. On a street corner better described as an absence, he harmonizes with the car alarms and howling strays. Throw a dollar in his open case and watch it fall forever as if through a night sodden with every other blue black night that was or might have been. They say before the cars and even before the feral dogs and avenues, before any of the above was imaginable, he'd make a ram's horn cry, coax a low whistle from the brittle throat of a crow. They say when it was just the night in him, he taught the night what lonely meant. In this sequence, um, Gatso Barbieri is being pursued by a man who looks exactly like him. And he's seeing him in mirrors and shit and he's kind of weirded out. And this guy may or may not be immortal. It makes even less sense when you read it on the page. This is called The Man in the Dusk Colored Glasses on Authenticity. They often mistake me for the Argentine. It doesn't bother me. I've been mistaken for worse. A bugler beheaded in a cavalry charge, a punk who snaps the strings of liars for laughs. A common misconception, I'm married to the muse. Fact is, we haven't seen each other since Athens, that disastrous back and now bad grapes and alimony ever after. The Catholics tell me all books, crap or classics are authored by the Holy Spirit. I'm more sparrow than theologian, so good or ill, I make no claims on spirit, but I know all songs since the first vein hummed with its, with its blue debut of blood, clamor and scrape toward the same canopy of stars. Admittedly, I may have once possessed the body and blood of the Argentine, that sax man known as Gato B, for that brief flicker colloquially known as a lifespan. No matter. A voice on a radio breaks like bread as I flee a city swamped with light. Jazz is dead, the static says, and a muddy shovel clatters a sly rhythm in my trunk that proves otherwise. This is pasar mi vida cantando, or to spend my life singing. All day screeching through this instrument till the throat's raw and the only reward is the desire to screech no more. 
I thought my time would be best spent this way, in the daylight between grace notes, tongue against the splintered reed, air bents into the shape of metal after a car wreck. I thought trouble would leave me like a parasite after the last antibiotic, but I know better now. Tonight, my record spins in a mirrored discotheque where I teach a smuggler's mistress card tricks and pull a con man's brim across my brow. I'm gonna read, uh, I'm gonna read one more. I wanna dedicate this to all the Michelles in the house. This is called Sundress and Nail. Sound is air that's pushed around or coaxed or pulled or just allowed to wander on volition to billow through your sundress hanging on a nail. From the stairway, a spoon's faint chime against coffee cup ceramic echoes in my chest like a church bell. Here, upstairs, your sundress on a nail, floral and silk against blank brick, rustles like wind chimes with their throats slit, makes a music of its own denial, a song where sundress and nail give refuge to two mute sparrows. No, our music is not this air, not this hollowed out space through which all free falls. This sundress hanging on a nail is not the body you once gave it when you came to it salt wet and naked, parting the beaded curtain, Michelle, taking down your sundress from a nail. Thank you. I want to give uh, the folks another round of applause for our next thing. We have some books for sale. Poets will be signing books. If everyone could please put your chairs against the wall, I would be grateful. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. I've seen you read before. I don't know if you remember her. I tried it. I tried it. Yeah, I, 